Welcome back, my friends. I have another exciting episode for you here on the Lucra podcast. I am joined today by Chelsea Williams. And get this, this is her title. She is the money whisperer, and she is a chief financial architect. So clearly, lots of awesome stuff, very resonant with the whole concept of this show. Chelsea, I'm stoked about this. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm honored to be here contributing to the conversations you're having. Yes. So let's get into it. First and foremost, what does a money whisperer do? So I got the idea. Did you ever watch the Discovery Channel? There was the dog whisperer. Yes. On there. And like he understood dogs at like a technical way. And then he also understood them in this other way that people were like, I don't get it. My dog never does that for me. Right. Um, and because he had this like whispering capability. So money whisper to me represents this understanding that I have not only of, you know, the technical side of money, but also understanding the human condition and how that shows up in each individual's money story. So amazing. So let's kind of back up a bit. I want to know how you came to get into doing that type of work. Yes. Um, so it was by accident. <laughs> Those are always the best stories. <laughs> it is, it is. And you know, nowadays we've kind of we're kind of hip to the idea of find something that you love doing and then monetize it. And my right. story is a little backwards in that graduating high school, I was in a generation where they were really funneling us towards healthcare. Um, and strategically so, right? Because baby boomers are a thing and they needed us to take care of them in nursing homes and hospitals and things sure. like that. And so I listened to the they, that be, and I was like, okay, I'll go to college for healthcare administration. And um, I got into my second semester and this accounting class showed up on my schedule and I had no clue what accounting was at all, <laughs> at all. This, this <laughs> is making the story even better. <laughs> yes. Yes. So then I, I started asking people like, what is this class? What is this thing called accounting? And every single person that I asked was like, oh my God, I hate it. I don't get it. I had to change my degree to, because of it. I had to take it three times to pass it. So I'm like, oh shit, like I'm gonna have to change my degree, <laughs> you know? Um, but I tried it anyway. And what I found is that that's just how my mind works. Accounting made complete sense to me, complete. It was like a puzzle pleat piece clicking together. And so I'm like, okay, if, if 90% of the world hates this thing called accounting and I totally get it. I'm going to roll with this. Nice. <laughs> right. Um, and so I did, uh, I ended up landing a job with a local business here in town who had just moved out of his garage and into a downtown office and was exploding. And he hired me as an office assistant. He was like, I don't know what I need. I just know I need help. I need something something. I don't know. And I'm like, I'm here. Let's do it. Let's roll with it. And, um, he was getting to the point to where he needed to actually do his books and, you know, get financial statements. And he was working with a CPA that does what I hear so many, it's, it's kind of a stigma in the area. Unfortunately, it's just this very reactive over promise under deliver thing that happens in accounting and tax. And so his CPA was kind of dropping the ball. And I was like, Hey, I've taken this one accounting class. Like, you want to give me a shot? Maybe I'll try this thing, right? Uh, and he let me. And it nice. was that opportunity that like blew the doors open and accelerated where from that day to where I am now. I did everything. I took on my accounting teacher as my mentor. She helped me get everything set up. He ended up being in multiple states. I, that's where I got my street smart for what I do. And from there, I was VP at a tax and accounting firm. I got recruited by the mentor that I had checking my work to make sure I was doing the right things right. And my experience at the tax and accounting firm is where I learned all of the stigmas and the mm -hmm. things that I knew we could just do better at. Uh, and so when I left there, I started my first company. Core Solutions Group. And that was kind of my beta company to get to know the human side of money because we weren't doing that in the tax yeah. and accounting firm. We weren't, you know, teaching people or telling them to ask us questions about how to understand these reports that we were giving them every month. 
Um, and so Core Solutions Group has been up and running for seven years next month now. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a wonderful team. I've got about 12 people and we're to the point now to where my team knows more than I do. They're Perfect. better at what they do than I am. And so it should be. <laughs> yes, it's amazing. Um, and so for the past two years, I've been removed enough to start uh, my second company, which is Money Mastery. And that is where I'm at right now, which is teaching people financial literacy um, and how they can look at their money, like literally look at their money and look at like, how is this a reflection of me and what can I learn from this and how can I change my money story? Yes, yes, yes. All things that I preach. I'm so happy to be having this conversation. Talk to me about, because the way that I talk about it, I'm sure yours is resonant, if not the same exact wording. I don't know. I talk about it as a relationship with money and how we treat that relationship is similar to like if we had a relationship with a human being, whether it be a spouse, significant other, father, child, whomever. It's like, how are you treating that person, that relationship? And then how is that showing up in, oh my gosh, the money's not here. Well, maybe because you treat that money like crap, right? <laughs> I'd love 100%. to hear your, like how you would talk about that or how you would define like that, that connection or that relationship with money. Absolutely. It is a relationship, but we're, we're so on the same page right now. Um, and one of the biggest uh, things that I think people struggle with is actually looking at the numbers, even just facing it, because there's this feeling of like, I know I'm not doing it right. And I should probably understand these things, but I don't. And so I just, I don't even want to look because it's, it's fear driven, right? The fear of actually looking. But then once you do look, and start the conversation, which also takes time, by the way, like you have to mm -hmm. invest your time and focus and energy into building that relationship with, with the numbers. And like with any other relationship, ask questions. You can't get to know somebody if you don't ask questions. You also can't have a healthy relationship if you don't set the expectations and the boundaries, right? And with your money, like you can expect of your money specifically, how much you want to make, how much you want to keep, how much you want to give, how much you want to invest, but you have to be clear about what are my expectations with my money, right? And then what are the boundaries? What are the boundaries with my money? And usually that comes in the form of a budget or some type of spending control mechanism, whatever works best for you. But like, just like with a person, if you don't honor those boundaries, that's when things start to go wrong or get out of control? Uh, yes. And I know we don't know each other very well, but just to give you like the two second little background, when I first started my business, I had all these dreams, hopes. I'm like, oh, I'm going to be like the world's best coach. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to make a million dollars within the first year. You know, you've heard these things. Uh, within two years, I had no money. My house that I owned in Michigan was foreclosed. I was evicted from the apartment that I was living in in Portland. And then the year after that, filed bankruptcy. And oh, by the way, didn't pay taxes for two years. So what you're talking about with like just not wanting to know, 100% fear, yes. And when it is at the point, like, and I want to say this for anyone listening that might be at this point, in addition to fear is so much shame because there is this idea that I should know how to do this. I should know what is going on. I should know how to fix this. I'm a smart person. What the hell just happened? So like within two years, everything that was a dream totally turned into a nightmare. And that is what really like set me on this path to be like, let's redefine this conversation around what even is wealth. What the hell we do, do we do with this money stuff? How do we get more of it if that's what we want? Like what is happening? So I just want to like, piggyback on everything that you're saying and be like, yes, yes, yes. So let's maybe talk about some solutions. <laughs> if those mm -hmm. out there listening are like, oh my gosh, I get it. Like I, I don't even know, or I don't want to look, or maybe both. Like, how do you even start? Well, I love what you said about the facts, because I know it's a fact. People carry so much shame around oh, money. It was brutal. I didn't even want to talk. I literally didn't. I mean, I was doing like coaching, first of all, hello, as a coach, I should know what the hell I'm doing. I didn't. Uh, two, I was leading seminars, like where I talk a lot about my personal life. I didn't mention that for probably 
I don't know, five years. And then the first time I did, oh my gosh, I still remember because I was bawling my face off. I'm on stage in front of like my group and just the biggest mess ever because it was the first time that I like publicly stated this is what I went through. Mm, but how much, like I can feel it as you'd say, like how much of a pressure release was that? How much was that a like- well, it sucked okay, at the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was terrible. In that experience, I was like, oh my God, like this is the worst thing ever. But I will say that that also started healing a lot of it is just being open and honest and being like, look guys, and what's interesting, and I'm sure you experience this like all the time, is that when I'm open and talking about it, I often will say like, hey, you know, who else has gone through something like that? And just so many hands will raise and they're like, yep, filed bankruptcy too. Yep, uh, lost my house. Yep, this happened, whatever, you know, and it's it just creates a a deeper connection because of that authenticity. Yes. And and I think what we have to do when we can recognize that so many people have this same relationship with money is we have to ask ourselves why, like, why is it that most people have this almost non-existent relationship with their money? And to me, the answer is nobody's taught us. Nobody's teaching us. Like it's kind of required, like no matter what your plan is with your life or your business, money is part of that plan. It is a requirement. Even Martin Luther King, God, all these great people and all the great things that they did required money. And so school did not teach us. There's only two or three states right now where it is a required curriculum. And so what I want to say to your audience, like if this is you right now, if you have that feeling in your chest right now, like, oh my God, they're talking about me right now and all this shame, like I want to give you permission to detach that shame from your money story, because now you have the power to make the decision to educate yourself. And like Warren Buffett said, accounting is the language of money. You just don't speak the language. And if you can learn how to start a business, if you can learn how to create a process, if you can learn how to use MailChimp and email, I promise <laughs> you you can learn money. And there's this myth out there, like people are like, oh, I'm bad at math. I can't do this. Look, you know, all the math you need to know by fourth grade. Right. And there's I calculators. Do. Like we got, we got things like this to do that for you. <laughs> yes. 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 So, you know, if that's you, I think the first step is, you know, admitting that you don't know and being willing to ask for help. Because at the end of the day, this is, this is your life, your thing. If you don't reach out and ask for help, just like you did with all the other things you had to do in your business, your money story is not going to change. So true. Like I almost don't have anything else to say after that. Cause I'm like, yep. Mic drop. <laughs> it is yeah. like, it's, it's an ownership. It's a taking responsibility. It's recognizing, oh, I created whatever this situation is. And somehow I like how you said kind of extracting those two different things because not making yourself wrong and bad, because I definitely did that. And that did not help. I was like, I'm such a, you know, idiot. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but like it was all there. And it was a terrible, terrible time in my life. I remember saying to my husband, who I met later, like, I really just wish I could go to sleep and like wake up when all of this was over. It just that I didn't even want to be living my life at that time. When to the outside world, people were like, hey, everything's rocking. She's doing really well. Everything's great. It was not great in the slightest. So I just so appreciate people like you that are like, let's have this conversation. What are some things that people can do, like actual first steps to even begin to understand that language that you talked about. Yes. So whether, whether you're personal or business, you cannot measure what you cannot see. So if, if you're looking at your personal money life, get, there are so many apps out there right now that will help you track your spending so that you can just see the numbers visually, right. And start to make sense of them in, in the business world, this comes in the form of bookkeeping. So if you work with a bookkeeper well, if you don't get one, um, because it is not your highest and best use of time to learn bookkeeping, what the highest and best use of your time is, is making sense of what your bookkeeper gives you. So 
in business that comes in the form of monthly financial reports, hopefully, right? Well, understanding- like You're like, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Well, because I know some people have a bookkeeper and it just doesn't happen. And that it's that whole reactive stigma, mm. right? So if, you, if you're that person, I would highly recommend finding a new bookkeeper. Um, but getting to the point to where you get regular monthly financial statements, that is your foundation, right? But then knowing what you can do with those financial statements, making sense of them, rearranging them, the way you describe the money that you make and where it goes so that you can look at a financial statement and understand what you're looking at, where your KPIs are, your key performance indicators, right? And, and to even step back a moment, you have to call your shot in life and in business. That whole, like, what do you want? Like you say on your episode, like, what is wealth to you? Because that's what we're going for here. Wealth and abundance and freedom, right? Like, mm -hmm. what does that even mean to you? Yeah. What direction are you going? Do you even know what it is? So then when it shows up, you are aware of it. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people, when they hear the word wealth, like the first thing that comes to mind is money you know, and I think it's important to, to understand that wealth is really about relationships and experiences. Like money is the mode by which you create time, but what you do with that time is what is going to create your, your true wealth in life. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, you have to, you have to call your shot specifically and shamelessly, especially with women. We have this idea that, you know, making too much money is bad or our, our revenue is capped or, you know, we don't ask for what we want because we should be doing other things, you know, but really figuring out what is the lifestyle that you want and how much money does that mean in your pocket? Because the rest is math. We can reverse engineer the numbers in business and figure out who you need and when you need to hire them and what you need on a return on marketing, like all of that is figure outable, but there are thousands of different directions your business could go. You got to figure out which one you're intentionally going to choose before yes, you can yes. move forward. Yes, yes. And yes. And that keyword right there, choose, it is your choice. You can do any of the things or all the things, maybe not all at the same time, but like it is all out there as potential for you right now. So having that clarity, picking that direction, making that choice, absolutely. Yes. What about you personally? Have you had money struggles or has have things generally worked out for you? Like, I'm always curious about the things that help create, I'm not going to say like are fully responsible for, but help create the money stories that we have. And then, well, I'll just, I'll pause right there. <laughs> what has been your biggest challenges in money? You know, I wish I had this like really deep emotional story about how I had a really bad situation with money that I came out of, but the truth is that I didn't. And I think the reason why that is, is because I had great parents who instilled great core values into me. I was not afraid to work. I was not afraid to hustle. And so money was never scarce for me. And we didn't grow up rich. Like we were middle-class my dad was a semi driver. He started his own business about 20 years ago that he's getting ready to hand off to my little brother. Um, and so I had great examples. I had the ethic to get out there and like, take what I wanted, go and work for it and, and get it. And I've never spent lavishly. I've never overvalued um, material things. I'm, I've, you know, figured out how to be comfortable with what, like my money habits are in line with what I'm making and that I create the environment that makes me happy. Um, and so it's never really been a struggle for me. What do you think are some of the the underlying things that maybe create struggle for others? You know, those of us that have gone through like these big things, what would you, like, if I was coming to you, let's say, I don't even know when that was like over 10 years ago. And I was like, Chelsea, uh, here's my situation. Like what the hell happened? What might you have said to me. Yes. So our money story is driven by the same things that the rest of our life is driven by, right? Beliefs and habits. And beliefs and habits, we establish over 50% of them by the age of seven, what researchers call our imprint 
period in life when we're this sponge, right? And so a lot of what we carry out in the physical world when it comes to our money comes from what we were taught, what we experienced, and what we saw at, from, from a very young age. And those habits tend to, you know, stick with us. And so for people that are in those situations, I think your biggest tool is reflection and going three layers deep. I call it three layers deep because when you ask yourself and answer the question, why three times, that's when you start to hit gold. You start to hit gold. Like I'm in this situation right now and it's just, it seems like the end of the world. Okay. Well, why are, why are you in this situation? Can we, can we look at, you know, some of the reasons? Well, I'm in this situation because, you know, I spent more money than I had coming in. Well, why did you do that? You know, why did you, well, I thought I needed this thing. And they, they told me that if you want a profitable business, you have to spend all this money on software and marketing and da -da -da -da. <laughs> right. All the things that like are not things. as important as we make them out to be. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, why did you follow they? Huh? I guess I never thought there was another option to create a different path. Right. So I think that you have to, is reflection. Reflection is so powerful in life and especially in money, like retracing your steps and figuring out what did I do that kind of pivoted me to where I am now and what all played into that and what could I do differently and apply that to my future and learn from it. Yeah. Cause that's the thing, you know, planting the seeds today is what is creating your reality for tomorrow, the next day, next year, et cetera. I want to like key in on two, two words that you used habits and beliefs. Because 100%, like in my own story, this was circa like 2008-ish. So the housing crisis was going on, the Great Recession was happening, like all, like the ec economy was not great. But the reality is, regardless of how the economy was doing, I didn't know what the hell I was doing as a brand new entrepreneur. I had come from a Fortune 100 company, like always done that, and then didn't know what I was doing. And on top of it, was so hyped up on the law of attraction because the secret had just come out like somewhere around that time and everything's like, you just got to think good thoughts. Money's going to show up in your lap. And I was like, baby, let's go. Let's make a million dollars in this coaching business. Well, let's just be clear. That didn't exactly happen. <laughs> so it was the habits and the beliefs. I want to talk to you about some of your habits and beliefs. As, as you know, I have a question that I ask all of my guests and it's based on the acronym HERB. So the H in HERB stands for habits. I would love to know what are some of your habits, both in your life in terms of like your schedule, but also specifically your money habits. Yes. So there was a, a phrase that came to mind when you, when you said that, and it's the you know, a, a dream, a, a hope without a plan is just a wish. Oh, and it was a big right? wish. <laughs> and so like, and I, I subscribe to the law of attraction. I truly believe that the energy you put out is the energy that you get back, but it's a piece, right? So again, we have to own our side of it. Yep. And that's where the habits and the beliefs come into play. And so for me, I have this, this kind of non-traditional relationship with habits. I'm not a, the, the type of person that can do the exact same thing every morning or every day. I, I don't like that mundane thing. And so I have like this musical chair thing with my habits and my routines, <laughs> right? It sounds perfect um, to me. Where I wake up and I know the things that fuel me for the morning and I'll just pick whatever I feel like doing that day. And I'm not going to have shame if I don't do them all. Right. And so for me, what that looks like is practicing gratitude, um, like waking up and being intentional with my thoughts um, and feeling it on a physical level, because thinking about like, oh, I'm so glad I have a roof over my head. That's not gratitude. Gratitude is feeling it in your body, in your soul, like that feeling that you get when something happens in real life with a real life person in your face. And it's like the butterfly fly, fluttery you know, thinking about it and meditating on it to the point to where you feel it physically, that's gratitude. Um, and some days that looks like me messaging three of my friends just to say, hello, how are you doing? How's this? How are the kids? I care about you. I love you. Just letting them know that like, I am here because I have, you are a valuable relationship in my life, right? Those personal touches. 
Um, I also practice meditation. Uh, I think that everybody should practice meditation. And I'm so excited because it used to be this thing that was like hippy dippy, like woo woo. Oh, you meditate. Mm, you're one of those. But like science has measured exactly. in data the effectiveness of meditation. Like it's undeniable. It is not a myth anymore. For those of you that still think it is, I'm telling you right now, the research is in. <laughs> Check the data, people. There is no denying that meditation is effective. And, and how timely is it in the world we live in today that we're acknowledging the validity of meditation? So crucial and important. Oh my gosh. Like in a time where protecting your mind is probably the most important thing with all of the options and social media and distractions that we have available to us. And to me, that's what meditation is. It's protecting your mind and being intentional with your thoughts. So that. that's it's my... almost like, it's almost like self-defense for your brain. I love that. It is. It is. It's right. It is. Um, but you know, of course, physical activity, I really like to do yoga. Um, me and my daughter go to the gym. She's 15 years old and an athlete. So that works out really well. She holds me accountable some days. She'll drag me nice. to the gym. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I am, I'm intentional about what I put in my body. I am not perfect, but I do well on more days than I don't. And that's my goal. Uh, and journaling, um, mm. journaling, a planner where I write down those, I actually have a law of attraction planner. Um, and then I have a journal that I take with me almost everywhere I go so that I don't lose those thoughts that are fleeting, but yes. really good. So important. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So let's move on to the E. The E stands for environment. How do you set up your environment, whether that be your office, your home, your car, wherever your space is, so that you can be most productive and successful? Yeah, so environment. Environment to me are people and places, right? And the same idea goes with my environment as with my mind. Like I protect, I heavily guard my environment. The people and ideas that I allow into my mind and space is very intentional. And there are even people in my life, family that I love. I, I truly love them unconditionally, but I know that they are toxic in my personal space and in my mental space. And so I love them from a distance. Like yep. I am willing to, you know, make sure that I don't allow people into my physical and mental space. And then my physical environment, I'm a homebody. I love my home. Like I love so you're talking home. my language. I'm like, I don't even need to go out necessarily. <laughs> right. Right. So I'm very intentional about my home. We've been here for about two years now. Um, and I have my plants around me. I have pictures and colors that make me feel, um, you know, cozy and vibrant and alive. I just got my back deck put on nice. last fall. And so that is like, my peace out there. Like first thing in the morning, I go do all of my morning habit routine things on my deck. If I can, if it's nice enough outside, but I just, I love it. And the view, I, I also live four houses down from my dad. I'm a daddy's girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, being close to him for me and my kids, um, creates abundance in our lives for sure. Nice. I love that. I also love that horse that you have there behind you on the wall. My Chinese Zodiac is a horse. So I'm always like very resonant with the energy of a horse. Oh yeah. They're my favorite ever since a kid. Like if you were my grade school teacher, you got a drawing or two of a, of horse, a horse like <laughs> running across a beach with a sunset behind it. I love horses. <laughs> that is awesome. All right. So the R in herb is resources. Resources could be books, programs, whatever. What resources have really impacted you that might impact others and you'd recommend? Yeah. So along with all of the the common ones, like you said, books, I'm, I'm always reading uh, podcasts and, you know, in-person events. Uh, also having a coach, a mentor, somebody that's always mm -hmm. challenging me and seeing me from a different perspective. Um, and, and so I can continue to round myself out. One particular resource that I love is Mind Valley. Have you heard of Mind Valley? I've spoken at their event. Yeah. 
I love <laughs> Mind Valley. Like it is my, I could go there and get almost like anything that I could possibly need. I, I live in their app. I love yes. it. Yes. Yeah. If you look way, way, way back to when they started Awesomeness Fest, I spoke at the very first one in Costa Rica. Did you? Yeah. That's the A-Fest, right? Awesomeness yeah. Fest. Yeah, it used to be. Thing. Yeah. Awesome. They shortened it. You know, it's it's more yeah. hip now. It's A-Fest. But yeah, back in the day, I think that was 2010, maybe. I don't know. It was a long time ago. But uh, yeah. That is so awesome. Small world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. As soon as you said, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Marissa Peer is one of my favorite on there. I have a personal like interest. In another life, I was a neuroscientist somehow. Right? I think I probably was too. Yes. Like I love listening to her stuff. Nice. I also want to ask you because I am a book fiend. I love books. I read them all the time. I buy way too many of them. Uh, what books in particular as resources, like have really, what are some of your favorite books? And it doesn't necessarily have to be just business, just in general. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because I have tried so hard to read non-business or self-help books and it never works out. Like those are just my thing. <laughs> all right, well then, then let's focus there. <laughs> business, yes. self-help, which, which ones are the ones that most like <clears throat> impact you? Yes. So my like Bibles, I call them my business and self Bibles, uh, atomic habits mm. is amazing. Um, profit first. Have you ever oh, heard of huge. profit first? Yeah, 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 for sure. I, I teach that because I'm like, listen guys, this makes it so easy. Yes. Yes. Profit first, which I was actually using in my personal life before I ever read the book. So if that's not just another sign that I'm doing, nice. that I should you're, you're on the right path. <laughs> Like those are my money habits, profit first. And I don't spend what I don't have. And I prioritize Perfect. investing and saving, right? Um, so yeah, Atomic Habits, Traction is another good one. And I think one of my favorites is Good to Great. Oh, nice. Um, because, and what I think what I love about it, a few things is they approach it like a scientific study so that it was all fair across the board, right? And they were, they were identifying what it takes to withstand the test of time and leadership. So one of my favorite parts of the books is they tried to leave leadership out of the picture, but then very quickly they learned that they could not. It doesn't work out so well. <laughs> it does. Yeah. So that's a good one. And you know, it does talk about publicly traded companies, but the principles and the flywheel absolutely apply to you, even if you are a solopreneur. Yeah. I love books like that, that really you can take just what what they're talking about. And it doesn't really matter. There's a really great one called built to sell. And even if you are never intending to sell your company, it's still super important to understand like how you might look at it if you were, because, oh, by the way, it's going to make your company better. So I love stuff like that. Yes. Okay. On to the B. What are your beliefs about the world, about money, about life, the ones that have really, really contributed to who you are today and what you've been able to create for yourself. Yes. Uh, so one of my favorites is that success, wealth, abundance, whatever that means to you, it is not an event. It is not something that just happens overnight, right? Like we can't go to sleep and let it pass and wake up. It's not going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> right. It is a habit. It is not an event. It is a habit. And so those daily things that we do in and out are, are what are so important. Right. Um, and another one is that nothing is impossible. Like nothing is impossible. And one of my favorite stories that really proves that, um, I'm, I like track and field. I'm a track and field coach. And so there's a story about a guy named Roger Bannister and Roger Bannister in 1954, and now mind you, the first Olympics ever was in 776 BC, right? So this is like a really long time, but up, until, <laughs> yes. but up until 1954, all of the experts said that anybody running a mile under four minutes is impossible. Like it is, it is humanly impossible for anybody to run a mile in under four minutes. Well, in 1954, Roger Bannister did that. 359 bitches. <laughs> he did the impossible, but here's the best part. Once he did it, a ton of people started doing it. Today, yep. there's over 1600 people that have done it. What he did is he gave people permission and he made them believe that it was impossible. He shattered the glass ceiling. And now all of a sudden, a bunch of people were walking through that hole in the ceiling that he left. So yeah. nothing is impossible. 
It's so true. I actually have, cause I use that in one of my courses, just that concept of belief, you know, does like controls everything essentially in our reality. And there's this really cool graph. I'll have to send it to you later, but it actually showcases like all the timeframes of tracked miles. And then there's Roger Bannister. And then it's like, shoom, and it's just got lower and lower after it's so it's great to highlight that. But anyway, like whatever, back to you. <laughs> what, whatever you, like you listener listening right now, whatever it is that you think you can't do, I promise you, if you look just enough, you will find examples of why whatever you think you can't do can absolutely be done. Yeah, because probably somebody has done it. And if somebody has done it, why can't you, right? Like what's what's the difference? And then we just get into our excuses and our blah, blah, blah whatever, go do it. What other beliefs do you have? Yes. Um, well, like I said before, you get exactly what you put out into this world. Exactly what you put out is what you get back. Even if you put it out unknowingly, like what you get back should be looked at. You should observe that. Right. Yes. And I'll go back to Marissa Peer. Marissa Peer has three rules of the mind. And rule number one is that your mind believes what you tell it that mental chatter, what you're saying up here, your mind works to make it your reality, literally. And the second thing that she talks about is that the mind responds to pictures, to things you see. This is why vision boards are so effective. And people are like, oh, I'm not gonna get a magazine and put it on a vision board. And I don't think in pictures. Yes, you do. Your brain, uh, you're human. Level, <laughs> your brain at a chemical level interprets pictures in a whole new way that adds to what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And the third one that she says is that your mind does not care what is right, wrong, real, fake, true, false. We and our environment, that imprint period, that is what determines what our mind deems these things are not. 100%. I love the people that they're like, well, that doesn't really apply to me. I'm like, okay, you are a human, right? And have you seen the research? And yeah, like your brain runs on things like dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all these neurotransmitters, like, and you're, you're telling me that like, that's not how it works for you. Just you. <laughs> that's like, crazy. <laughs> like I'm, and, and to them, I would say you are a unicorn. You are absolutely <laughs> exactly <laughs> at a fundamental level. <laughs> there are things that are just fact, like at a fundamental biological manifestation level, they're very universal. To whatever your unicorn looks like. It totally goes back to what you were saying earlier about how the science, the research, the data can now prove, you know, you were talking about gratitude, things like that. But like, I teach a lot of heart coherence and it's not just about like, oh, let me just get all like woo woo and feely and, you know, into my emotions. It's like, mm, look at the data and what happens in your body physiologically and so the data now, the science is backing up what the saints and the sages have been saying forever, which is so, so fun. I think we resonate on that, which is awesome. <laughs> so one final question. If you were to give a bit of inspiration, a bit of motivation to our audience today, especially maybe to those who, like we were talking about before, are in it right now, you know, there's like just going through something, what might you say to them? I would say that it's never as bad as it seems. Like if you look at all of the worst potential outcomes, like what is the absolute worst, right? What can't you bounce back from? And that there are so many opportunities out there right now in 2023. Yeah. So many opportunities. There is always a way. There's, there's always a few ways. Like you actually have options. <laughs> I love that. There's <laughs> always a few ways, at least. <laughs> there is. Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes I'll be working with somebody and the worst possible scenario is that like my business isn't profitable. My idea isn't profitable. Okay. Well, now we know let's get creative. What else yeah. can we do? What else can we create that will get you to this place? Right. Yeah, this has been awesome. Chelsea, if people are interested in learning more about you or maybe working with you or one of your companies, where should they go to learn more? Yes. So go over to Instagram and look up the money whisper. So whisperer was taken. It's whisper. Um, just whisper. And I've got, just whisper, the money whisper. <laughs> yeah. And we've got a link up in the bio that gives you all the options to work with us. 
perfect. And I will link to that as well. So for those of you that are watching on YouTube, it'll be down below in the comments. For those of you that are listening, you can check it out in the show notes at lucra.com. Chelsea Williams, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for being here. It is. Thank you for today.